Welcome to the MLK 2022 Celebration Program Towards Justice, a table talk on social justice and civil rights with eight award-winning African-American broadcast journalists. At the virtual table, Kumasi Aaron, Rosie Allen, Janice Edwards, Cheryl Hurd, Dana King, Barbara Rogers, Carolyn Tyler, and our moderator, Renell Brooks Moon. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Happy MLK Day and thank you for joining us for this special King Day conversation. You know, decades ago, Dr. King said, give us the ballot. Incredibly, here we are in 2022. Voting rights, Dr. King's very legacy is on the line. Today, in less than a year, over 100 voter suppression laws have been passed as a result of the big lie that the 2020 presidential election was stolen. As you know, the Senate will take this on tomorrow, though the odds do not look good for us. It ain't looking good for us. But here to discuss this and so much more, let's bring in our most distinguished panelists, my sister friends, longtime friends, and new friends in media. Welcome, ladies. Welcome. And Barbara, we're going to kick it off with you on the issue of voting rights. Um, Martin Luther King III said this weekend that there's no celebration without le legislation. Obviously, today is a, a day of service, and there are you know breakfasts and marches and all kinds of things going on to celebrate but he says, not until we get this legislation. So today is our focus on, uh, on what we need to do um, uh, for this battle for voting rights. So can you speak as a longtime veteran award-winning journalist, can you speak to this still being something that we're dealing with in 2022? Well, first of all, I'm so disappointed that we're still dealing with it because as you know, I grew up in the South during segregation when we did not have the vote. And once the 1965 Voting Rights Act was passed, I thought, we're here, we're here, and finally we're going to have it, even though there were still things being done. Now, it is so disappointing. But here's what I think needs to be done is all the time that has been spent trying to convince two senators who are never going to go along with this cinema and mansion to get on board that time and energy should go into being out in the communities all across the country because the polls all show that the general public is in favor of good voting rights in in favor of having one one person one vote and so a lot of the energy I think that has been put into lobbying those people in Congress should have gone out into the community and should be out in the community. They're starting to do that more, but I think they've waited a little late, but it's never too late if you can get it done. And the second thing is for all of us, we still have power. Uh, there are a number of petitions going around. I've signed a couple of them. There are a number of ones going around giving you a script that you can call your senator or somebody else's senator or any sen anybody you want to in Congress. But so remember, we pay them. They work for us, but they don't act like it. And we need to make sure they know that their bosses, us, are not happy with their behavior. So those are the things that I suggest we do now because it's true. It probably won't pass tomorrow, but that doesn't mean it won't pass at some point because Remember, we did not get here easily. It's not going to be easy to undo what they have been doing. And there's so much more I could say, but I know other people want to speak. <laughs> I know. I know. Thank you so much, Ms. Barbara. And one of the things that is suggested that we do today is reach out to uh, our senators. And I was going to say urge them, but I demand that they support <laughs> the Freedom to Vote Act. Um, let's talk to our, our new friend, our baby girl, Kamasi, who's at the anchor desk every morning covering all of this drama. Um, so from your perspective as, as a journalist, as we uh, are, are we're on the eve of this you know, voting rights battle, what has this been like for you covering it? And, and what are some things that you can share with us that maybe we can do? I think just watching and seeing how divided we are as a country has been just the, the sh most shocking part. I think when we think about the Civil Rights Act being passed in 1965, it was clear racism is a problem in this country. And I think for the most part, people were like, 
hey, we see these images in the deep south. We know this is something that we really need to uh, tackle and to change. But I think now it seems like people are living in different realities about what is right and what is wrong in our country. And to me, as I cover it, that's the scary part. I think sometimes people are might be okay with, you know, changing these laws. We've seen 20 states change these, these voting laws um, just since 2020. And so you're watching all of this happen. We, we're seeing how uh, uh, the Supreme Court decisions really changed and really gutted, I would say, um, the Civil uh, Rights Act. And, and it's just, it's, I think it's just a challenging time as a journalist to continue to report um, facts and then see how people interpret those based on, you know, maybe what is most beneficial for them. So I do think that we just have to, to keep going in a time where it feels like people tune you out if it's not something that they necessarily agree with. I think you just have to keep marching forward. And even if it does not happen tomorrow, which you know, when we look at the, the breakdown of our, our Senate and where some people stand, it does not seem likely. But I think like we have to be encouraged to keep going as journalists to keep reporting and keep sharing the truth, even in such a divided time. Thank you for that, Kamasi. Thank you for reminding us to remain encouraged because I really struggle with that. Mm -hmm. I really, really do like every day. <laughs> uh, Rosie Allen. Yes, ma'am. Let's let's talk about it. Talk about voting rights. Uh, you spent many uh, many hours on KGO radio covering oh, yes. all of the issues of the day. What are oh, your yes. thoughts on this? Well, I have this to say: November is a test, and it's going to be messy. It's messy now because of all of the the things that Kamasi said, all of the things that Barbara said, all the laws that have been changed, the voter suppression. If you can't uh, pass somebody a glass of water if they're standing in line, that's a mess. And it's going to be messy. The thing we have to stop, do, stop doing right now is we have to stop blaming Joe Biden and Kamala Harris for everything that's going on and not working in this country. They are two people who were given a mandate, but they're facing a brick wall every single day. And the negative press has really started to kick in, in case you haven't noticed. Um, those are the things that we also have to look at as well. But the thing we have to do is, first of all, we have to pray that uh, we can be strong enough to get hit the streets and do the things that we have to do. We have to support Biden-Harris, but we cannot continue to blame them. So hit the streets, call your legislature, late legislators, Make sure that your voice is heard. Make sure that you're out there saying, we're not gonna take this crap. Um, and then of course, when the time comes, you have to vote and you have to help your next door neighbor to vote. Just do what you know has to be done in order to get past this time. Because if we don't fix 2022, 2024 is gonna be even worse. And it's gonna change the tone of this entire country. So we have a lot of work to do. We do. We do, Rosie. And we can do it. People often ask, well, what can I do as one person? And we're, we're giving you uh, many examples today. So, so thank you for that. And speaking of, speaking of messiness, Rosie, also <laughs> uh, a result of the big lies, the 1621 insurrection. And we've actually recently learned how well planned and well organized it really was and how close this thing came to actually succeeding. So let's bring in Carolyn Tyler, formerly of uh, ABC7 News. And I'd like to ask you, Carolyn, what were your thoughts and reactions as you watched the events of that day unfold? And if you watched it with two hats on, private citizen hat, former journalist hat. That day was so surreal. I just could not believe what was happening. I mean, I had, we'd had four years of, of shock already and where you're thinking it can't get more crazy than it already is. Um, and I heard the president do his you know, speech, the former uh, White House occupant about got to fight like hell and march to the Capitol. And, but I, I was not thinking fight like hell meant the mob, the riot, the demonstrators. And 
the defiling of democracy, seeing the Confederate flag inside there, seeing the people, uh, the man with his feet up on uh, Congresswoman Speaker Pelosi's desk. Uh, it was scary, it was sad. I, I cried, I, I was angry, uh, just a, a, a hot mess. Uh, I looked at it primarily as a private citizen uh, since I had, you know, had been retired, but also thought journalistically, I was asking questions like, where's the security? Who, who were these people? What kind of advanced notice was there? Uh, where are the Congress people? Are, are they safe? Who's, you know, all those kinds of questions were flooding my mind. And as you said, now with the uh, commission, we're learning more and more about how this was a coup attempt that was well planned in advance and everything that's gone on since then. I'm sitting back waiting saying, when are some of the major players going to jail? Mm -hmm. When are, you know, I mean, we're getting these, you know, people along the way who were there but we know that there were members of Congress who were in on it. All this stuff over this big lie because this man can, could not accept his loss, uh, infuriating. And I, I just, I don't want it to stand. I want, I, I want to see, I know there's a, pro, <laughs> there's a process, <laughs> yeah. but it just seems like it's going so slowly as we wait for some of these people to be locked up. Lock them up, Carolyn Tyler. Lock them up. Lock them up. <laughs> I wanna bring in uh, Janice now, and thank you, Carolyn. Uh, Janice Edwards, our dear our dear sister Jan. Um, your thoughts uh, as you were watching the, yes. the horror of, of that day and how it has informed your work since then. Yes, thank you, Nellen. So glad to be here as we honor Dr. King, even as we are holding on saying, we've got to make sure that these rights are protected. I was outraged. I was outraged and in disbelief. I was working for Cron and paid for my own way to go cover the Million Man March years ago. And I remembered the security there. And one of the things that became part of the conversation later was, had these been black people storming, they wouldn't have gotten that far. I mean, it later became, but that's part of the thing I was thinking, First of all, how did they get there? But then I was in tears. This is our country that we love. And it was outrageous. And, and, and then to hear about the other threats that were going on through different parts of the country was part of it that was just unbelievable and outrageous. And then my show, Bay Area Vista, which I launched when I was at NBC Bay Area, now airs on Create TV. I did something the next week with two retired colonels, one white, one black, one a former Republican who has become a Democrat, the other a Democrat. And they were both saying that they saw this coming. They had written a book called Paradoxes of Power, Failed Leadership to address what had happened since 2016 and what needs to happen for leaders to stand up. So in so many ways, I mean, I thought about being an intern in Ron Dellum's office where I met Barbara Lee, Andre Swanson years ago when I was in graduate school in journalism and, and looking at, at, at this and, and, and as we were hearing about these nefarious strategies for continuing to steal the vote, I was so glad that those people had the presence of mind to take those votes because we can only imagine what would have happened had that not taken place. So I was wearing both hats that day. And I was, and as, as, as people were reporting on the news, I was saying, don't say that because they were saying, well, we understand that some of them are in the basement. It's like, don't report that because this becomes the thing that even as a journalist, you have to use that sense of what's the greater good and do no harm. And it was some of the things that were being telegraphed were telegraphing to terrorists. And we had to say, these are domestic terrorists who are trying to take over our country. So just a flood of emotions and very still concerned and saying right now, when we think about Dr. King and having grown up in Atlanta, 
having Andrew Young, Maynard Jackson, and Vernon Jordan as carpool daddies who drove us to school and talked about marching with Dr. King, having been in Methodist Youth Fellowship with Joseph Lowry as my pastor. Strate strategies and sacrifice are what we have to really look at now. And yes, I'm a talk show host and trained as a journalist, but also I'm a Black woman in this country. I'm an American, and we have to work together to protect what Dr. King and so many stood for and died for. Thank you, Jan, for breaking that all the way down. And I, I want to go to Cheryl Hurd now, NBC Bay Area. And uh, were you were you working on Insurrection Day, Cheryl, at all, or how did this affect your work? Uh, absolutely, I'm working every day. <laughs> Bless your heart. <laughs> yeah. So what I have to say is probably going to be much shorter than uh, what the other ladies might say because I am still covering the news. So I have to be um, purple. I can't be black. I can't be white. I, I can be a black woman with my voice, right. but I have to be neutral. So what is difficult for me is finding both sides and going to someone neutral and hearing something that you personally might totally disagree with and have a straight face and go with someone that you may totally agree with and have a state. I mean, I can't go giving high fives saying, oh yeah, you just have to go tell both sides of the story, put it together in a minute 40 and bite-sized pieces for people to understand it. And that's the difficulty in my job as a working journalist right now. My opinions don't matter. But what my what I try to do is to make sure that my stories are balanced, both sides. I can't let anybody know how I feel about it. And once I throw down the mic, it will be very lovely to be able to say this or say that. But while I'm here, I have to appear neutral and be neutral. And I don't have a problem with that. It seems like I've been trained to do this all my life that it becomes um, easy, but is that good? <laughs> because like I was saying earlier, uh, after I hang up the mic, it's gonna be a lot of therapy that I'm gonna have to go through suppressing <laughs> everything that I might feel personally. So it, it's been tough, you know, it's been, it's been tough. Yeah, and I think we it all- be hard you, because I, I, there's not really two sides. It, it, there's, there's just not. I mean, when they're saying something like uh, it was Black Lives Matter and Antifa, and you know that it's not, and that's just totally crazy, there really aren't two sides anymore. And I'm so happy that I'm out of that and don't have to, I totally understand what you're saying, Cheryl, because if I were still working, it would be the same thing where you're trying to gather not just both sides, but all sides, but it, that's, it's just, it's not true anymore. And that's part of what got us in trouble with the, the former guy in, in, in the White House is, is that everybody was trying to do a polite both sides with the crazy. But it's the way you, you frame things, right? So if you go in and say, you know, this group of people say that it was Black Lives Matter. This is what they say. The reality is ABC. Meanwhile, uh, someone so over here is saying this. I mean, it's this delicate yes. thing that right. you have to do every day that requires a lot of wine drinking on Saturday. <laughs> I know it's a challenge. Right. And I think that part of that too is that it is important to have both sides because as we are reminded, half of almost half of the American people voted because of, you know, voted in a different way. And we cannot come to saving our democracy, which people on both sides may agree about, even if they have different opinions without seeing both sides. I mean, that's one of the things that you do. Well, Cheryl Van Jones has been doing these stories about that too, because we can't just eliminate one side. We have to hear so that we can finally find common ground. Even with the voting that's coming up tomorrow, there are some senators who probably agree for voting rights. It's just like how Joe Biden mentioned about, President Biden mentioned about Strom Thurmond finally coming to a different understanding. But that understanding comes from truth being, being promoted as well as both sides being heard. Okay, bringing it back to that day, 
And I know, Renell, you yeah, have I wanna, to move uh, on. We only have like 20 minutes left. Dana. I'm sorry. Right. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. And I, I just, ahead. I want to get, I want to get Dana in here. Yes, and, absolutely. Thank you. I, I, no, I, that's, told Lena, I told Lena this was a three hour show. <laughs> <laughs> we're going. That's where we're going. <laughs> Dana King, it's, it's, it's amazing to see you. I don't know when's the last time I, I, I saw you in person. And for, it's amazing to see you and you are living your best life, following your passion. And I, I want those that are watching today that may not know what your second act has become. Um, if you would share what your work is now, we're going to show some of it as well. The black bodies in bronze. She is an artiste, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. And Renell, we're going to be um, working together with the giants, uh, creating the a sculpture of the very first woman to play professional baseball. Tony wow. Stone, first mm. woman, black woman, played for the Negro League. She's going to have a sculpture down by the stadium. Mission Rock Development, it's part of it. Tony Stone played for the San Francisco Sea Lions, That's Trailblazer. Right. Thank right. you for doing that, Ms. Dana right. King. And we're going to well, actually talk is, about, talk about is, your work. Well, I create black bodies in bronze, and I, I consider it a, a subversive act in that um, I am recontextualizing uh, a medium that um, most often tells a Eurocentric um, and in many cases a white supremacist story. And representation is vital. We deserve, African descendants deserve to see ourselves out in public. And sculpture inhabits space. And space is power. And, and I I create this work so that children can see their aunts, their grandparents, their moms, their dads. It's that, it's that moment when Obama bent over and that little boy touched his hair and he said, we have the same hair. I mean, <laughs> that's the joy of, of, of knowing that you matter, that your people have always mattered. And, that, um, and that's what I do. And, and it's a continuation of my job as a journalist. Um, my goal is to tell the truth of, of, of our history out in public. And, um, and I love when I get to tell the stories that people don't know about. Um, this is Monumental Reckoning in Golden Gate Park. And what this sculpture is doing is decolonizing that space. That space was built with wealth, and it was built for the white population of San Francisco. And, um, and my goal is, is for there to be art, cultural art that tells the history of all the people in the Bay, but brings all the people in the Bay to that park so that everyone can feel comfortable in a public space. There are 350 ancestral figures that surround the plinth of white supremacist Francis Scott Key. Now I'm grown. I was 60 years old before I learned his history. Yeah. Not only was he an owner of other human beings, but he doubled down on his power and his position and his access to powerful people and his money to further enslave African descendants. His brother-in-law was Justice Taney, who sat on the Supreme Court and wrote the Dred Scott decision, who said that Black Americans can never be citizens of this country. So they, they prospered. In, in ways that were horrible, right? Um, so a lot of us are wondering, what should we do with all this white supremacist monument, uh, monumental statuary in this country? And I used to think, okay, give me a wrecking ball and I'm good, we're, <laughs> we're taking it all down. But now I think we need to tell the 360 degrees of the story. Um, because without our history, Francis Scott Key would not have been elevated. This is King William Lanson and um, uh. such a beautiful man. He um, was a free African descendant in New Haven, Connecticut, and he helped build the infrastructure of that city. And most people don't know his history. And um, a group called the Amistad Committee uh, commissioned me to create this sculpture. He used his money and he was well paid as an engineer. He, he literally built out the long wharf in that city to make it the longest in the country at the time so that New Haven could compete with uh, New York for commerce. And he would 
literally carve boulders out of the quarry, put them on a barge, take them down river, jump off the barge and set these rocks in the water himself. I mean, so not only was he smart, but he was strong and uh, he built the first uh, community for enslaved and free African descendants and Native Americans and poor whites in, in Connecticut. He fought for voting rights. He fought for um, representation in the legislature. He was very outspoken. He was well regarded and respected. But then one day he became too powerful, had too much money, and they took it all from him and he died in the poorhouse. So when this sculpture was installed, the mayor of that city, Mayor Elliker, apologized to William Lansing. And he, he, um, he, he, what's the word? He, he um, took away all of the crimes that he was charged with. Exonerated him. He, thank you, exonerated him. <laughs> and, um, and you know, this is what this country needs to do. One person, one story at a time is to apologize. Mm. Apologize for the harm that, that we still carry in our bodies because of, of our history here. And, that was also um, recently done for the Dred Scott decision in Louisiana. They also reversed that one and took yeah. his name off as being guilty of right. having sat in the white section of the train as a black man. And that's where that whole decision came from because right. somebody sat in the wrong part. And that decision affected all of us in terms of being the predecessor for all those Jim Crow laws right. that that's recently right. last month was also taken off the books. That's just right. last month, well, we <laughs> taken off the books last month. Okay. So have to keep and I think people, we need to make sure <laughs> that people who maybe don't sympathize with us, who mm -hmm. don't see it our way, understand those kinds of things because anybody can understand that a man who was black, who sat in the wrong section of a railroad car, of and got, and got convicted of that. And that conviction was applied to all black people for the next hundred years can understand how, what injustice is on that level. And so I think one of the things that I fault some of the people who consider themselves liberal or even, and I'm not coming down on any party, but even Democrats is for not doing a better narrative, mm -hmm. for not telling the other side of the story as well as the other side tells their lies. Right. Because mm -hmm. they craft a story of lies and oh. they put it out there every single day. The other side needs to craft the truthful story and put it out every day. Yeah, agree. And thank you so much for that, Barbara. And, and Dana, thank you for your amazing and powerful work. And I, I'm looking forward to the unveiling uh, of our Tony Stone statue. Yeah. I cannot wait. Um, we, we have just a little bit of time left and this is for everybody. We'll go around the horn. Um, we're moving into year three, living with COVID. Um, COVID and Black Lives Matter, the intersection of those two things for us as Black women in our industries, even retired. Um, I know for me, it's been extraordinarily difficult. Um, so I just want to go around the horn and do a check-in like people have been doing these last couple of years and see how my sisters are holding up because I'm going to tell y'all right now, I am not well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, that, I didn't mean to deliver that as a joke, but yeah, but I, I, am, I am not well and I have not been well for two years. So let's just do a check-in on everybody's physical, mental well-being, everybody's family and uh, Kumasi, baby girl, let's start with you because bless your heart, you had to work through this in cafeterias, in basements, on camp. bless your heart. <laughs> we have been, I mean, it had, you know, I came to San Francisco in 2019 and I would never imagine like this would be how my time here would be. Sometimes I'm like, have I really almost been here three years? Because I really feel like I only had a few months of just like really enjoying the Bay Area and then everything kind of got shut down. And it was tough for me because I'm from Florida and most of my family is still in Florida. So that made it kind of different and difficult and a little bit isolating um, to just, it just was kind of tough. You know, because you're trying to build your network. And that's why I'm so grateful for so many of you ladies, Carolyn, and all of you have really like 
stepped in to embrace me as a journalist here because that really meant a lot to me as someone who is not from here and trying to do this job and do this work here. Um, so I really appreciated that. And then you're right, going into work every day, dealing with COVID and the uncertainty of that. And then you're having to report on George Floyd and so many other instances like that. That's, you know, difficult. And Cheryl, you touched on that, just being like, this is what happened, but having so much emotion inside. Like sometimes I am anchoring and I have to pull my IFB out because some of the video and listening to some of these interviews, it can be very triggering because when that soundbite is over, you have to turn, turn you, you're back on and you have to finish the story. And so I have to do small things like that to take care of my mental health um, because it has just been a lot. But I think it's important for us to be here. Um, a lot of conversations we had at our station um, when George Floyd was, you know, happening and the reckoning around that. I was happy that I was in place to kind of give voice to some things that aren't really talked about. I think we're kind of taking a, a different step and being able to reveal more of ourselves. That's a balance too, because you're still a journalist, but I think it's important for people to have an understanding of the fullness of who I am as a black woman in this day and age doing this job and experiencing these things. So it's definitely been a journey. And the minute you think it's over, you're like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. We're just we're super proud of you. We're all watching you and, and rooting for you and and everything you said we can totally relate to cuz we've been through it mm -hmm. and we are indeed here for you. I think, you know, for for Barbara and Carolyn and Rosie, I can speak for them as well. I, I cuz I certainly they became what I needed. In yeah. radio, I, there's nobody I could go to. Then when I started doing more TV, they they became my mentors. But in, in certainly in sports, I had no one. So we want to be for you the woman that we may not have had when we when we were on our way and coming up. So and I could up. not let this pass without paying homage to Belva Davis, Absolutely. who was the first African American woman on television west of the Mississippi, not just in San Francisco. And she embraced me when I came here forty some years ago, nineteen seventy nine, and. I try to pass that on. I try to play it forward every time there's a new person, which is why I sent a note to Kamasi and to Jobina and said, welcome. I hope to meet you in person and have lunch with you because we all really do need to pass it on, play it forward. We're in a, we're in a very exclusive club, ladies. We're yes. in a very exclusive club. Yes. Rosie, for you, yes. how have these last couple of years been? I have Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I, I actually, I think I've adjusted because I still see friends. I still, you know, get out a little bit. I don't do restaurants or any of that stuff, but I do try to leave my home. If I don't leave home, then I'll go out and sit on my deck and do something like that. It's um, self-care more than anything else, because if we don't take care of ourselves, Renelle, and you know that very well, then no one else will. And the other thing that's happened for me is um, as a senior of a certain age, these are the, the past three years are the years that I've wanted to, before my knees go bad, I've wanted to go out and uh, do the vacations that I never was able to do for a month or three weeks. And so that's what's been most difficult for me. And then the other part is spending so much time in the supermarket, I can't quit now. <laughs> I, I, developed, I developed an addiction to ice cream and it gets me through many of these hard days i have right now in my freezer six different flavors and i always have some every day which i never used to eat before but i found out that's a pleasure i can look for and i know you have the whiskey flavor barbara because you brought some to my house i sure do i've, I've been i've been like a pusher you know i've been saying try ice cream it'll get you through the night and it does <laughs> All right, thank, thank you for that, Miss Barbara. <laughs> Let's go I back to uh, There's Jan. Jan. I can, I can add, Barbara, Vixen uh, Kitchen Vegan Gelato is, is something that's really good. Too. I'll try it. Mm. <laughs> just, just want to add that. 
But now it's, it was so wonderful. One of the first shows I did after the pandemic was the show with you talking about things when we talked about, oh, we have to see each other this way, thinking back in November of 2020 that this would be done soon. But unfortunately, it hasn't been. I think one of the things for me with, our, with my production company was learning how to do everything virtually and to MC virtually, as well as doing videos and figuring out ways for that. So that was one pandemic pivot. And then personally, Personally, it's been a challenge of I started family Zoom meetings, my family in Atlanta and different places where we realized we could have done this all along, but it just this forced that. And if there's any silver lining in this horrifically dark cloud, it has been the deepening of relationships. There's been a pruning also. I, there are people mm -hmm. that I definitely will call and say, hey, I haven't heard from you. Everything okay? You, you dread sometimes doing that because you want to make sure that everyone's still there, but also being more present, saying I love you even more often, letting people know how much they mean. And also taking my own temperature, needing to get on the elliptical more, work with the virtual trainer more because of that Vixen gelato, but also <laughs> just really being more prayerful. I mean, it's deep in spiritual life. And I used to joke during the times that at least I was quarantined in good company because at least I like myself. You know, so <laughs> like, I can't stand it anymore. But it it is. It's it's a horrific time. And I think that also the narratives of social engineering that make people feel like they're being manipulated during this time is something that we have to pay attention to because we need to be able to bring forth as much truth as possible, both individually in our lives and whatever we're doing for the media as well, so that people can understand what you're feeling is not unique mm -hmm. and truth that ministers to your soul is real, no matter what else you may see or hear going on around you. Amen to that. Thank you, Jan. Carolyn Tyler. Yes. Well, I, I can, a couple of things resonated with me. One that Rosie was talking about, because I had just uh, basically retired. I got a couple of those bucket list uh, international trips in, including Cuba that I had long wanted to visit. And then the door slammed. And I'm sitting here saying, I'm just getting ready to live my best life. And now I can't. So that was hard. Um, and what Janice had said about the Zoom uh, family calls, we started doing family game night. Uh, many of you know, I come from a huge family uh, of 11 and, uh, you know, trying to keep my mother company because uh, we're all scattered here and there. And that has really been a blessing. It has definitely brought our family closer together. We have a family Facebook page. We have a sibling text um, chain, those things. But um, I would say also that having that intertwined with the movement for social justice following George Floyd's uh, murder and seeing even here, I live in the Marina, which is one of the you know widest neighborhoods in San Francisco, but to see they had several marches um, down the street. And I just had hoped that that would be um, more than a moment that it would really be a movement. And I think that's been, it, it hasn't been what I had hoped it would be. So mm -hmm. there's some, there's a little, not pessimism about it, because I think that we still have to um, be optimistic about the future. But I think COVID kind of shut down some of that as well. Um, in terms of people getting out and building bridges and those sorts of things. Um, in terms of me personally, once I got over the fact that I wasn't going to be traveling like I wanted to, I'm one of those, I'm not a, uh, I don't do like Rosie where she doesn't go out. I mean, I do go out. <laughs> I, I grab Kumasi go here and there. <laughs> Uh, we, we do go to the restaurants. We do go to the club. Oh, that's recently. Be, that's recently. I just try to be careful. Yeah. Well, no, I've never, I never really, once the um, lockdowns and things were lifted, I just try to be very careful with who, whom I interacted and wear the mask and that sort of thing. But um, I 
go a lot more than some people in my family would like to see me go. But um, <laughs> anybody who follows on Facebook knows I'm. I've seen you. Yeah. Yeah. Ripping and running. And I've uh, seen you. Yeah, Jeff. you have found a way to live your best life yes. in a pandemic. In a pandemic, you should actually write a book, Carolyn. I swear, how <laughs> you should how I got through COVID because all of us follow you on social media. You're everywhere all the time, <laughs> for real. There is, you know, you COVID be damned. You're, you you yeah. have, you have found a way to manage, and I honestly, God, I really do envy that because I'm not kidding. I I am not well, and I was really feeling Cheryl hurt a lot about when she was sharing early, and I want Cheryl to come in now. Because um, it's just been really, it's just been hard and it's exhausting. First of all, I mean, the challenge is in reporting it. And then the exhausting part of having to talk about it all the time, which is what I've had to do um, in, in, my, in my profession for the last two years. I am so tired of talking about it. It is, it is, it is exhausting me and it has broken me. At many, many times, and I try to build myself back up. So, Cheryl, how you been doing these last well, couple of years? You know, it just shows me that we need to get together with that catfish we've been talking about for at least. Real. Damn right. You're damn that's, right. Yeah. That's number one. It's hard, it's exhausting, but we can't get tired. We have to keep telling these stories over and over and over again. And I work on MLK Day every year for a reason because when someone turns on the television on this day, I I want my face to be there. I'd love to be off, but I never ask for it off because I feel that it's important to be there, number one. And it's really tough to tell these stories and work out of your car. <laughs> <laughs> you know, beg people to talk to you from your computer like you're doing right now. It's a whole different way of, of doing things. It's, and we're doing it. And it's exhausting. Yes, Renell, everyone out there, you know, it is exhausting, but you just can't stop. You just can't because we have to get the word out there about these things, how um, getting your uh, shots for COVID is important for different communities, not just the black community, but for everybody, what this voting rights situation means. And, and it's also important to, to let people know that we're not exempt here in California because we're protected. We're still not exempt for what's going on in, you know, Ground Zero, Georgia. So there's so many stories that I have to fight to tell, but I'm going to keep fighting. I don't get to tell them all. I don't even get to tell a lot, but the mm -hmm. ones I do get to tell. Yay! Yay! The applause. <laughs> and that's yes. what's so important is to continue the fight. And that's you know we go back to what I started with in the very first question about voting rights. We have to remember that for us, and Lord knows there have been so many times when I was a kid and as I've been an older person said, when does it end, Lord, when does it end? When do we just get taken for who we are, which is wonderful people? I you know, made up my mind a long time ago. It's probably never gonna end. I take little breaks from the fight, but I do know that we cannot ever stop fighting. And we hope to infect that new generation with that will to fight because we won't live forever. And again, I have to bring up Belva's name because Belva was one of those who has fought, fought, fought till she couldn't fight anymore. I felt like there was some of that fight I took on and now I'm hoping to pass it on to others because I'm about at that stage where I don't have the energy either. Well, that's why but I really is just so think important. that I just think that it's so important that we make sure mm -hmm. that the next generation knows how important it is. To well, that's why Kamasi is so important right now. Yes, that's why we love you, Kamasi. And Jaleesa, the, the, that's why we cheer when we see you on the yes, air and hear yes. you say certain things, you and Jobina, that we want to be said that we can't say because we aren't out there anymore. And yes. you too, Cheryl, we cheer for you yes. still being there and wonder how you are still there, you and Pam. <laughs> <laughs> Because We're we still know there. how tired we Hanging got. On. Yes, <laughs> you're doing it. And Nell, I just want to send you so much love too, because just like you said, I think it takes the courage to say not okay. Yeah. Because we really are not. It's it's not normal. It's not okay. And we're and you have to find those ways. And I'm so glad that we can all just come together as we are today, because that's part of what the message of love that Dr. King shared too, is something that we don't often hear enough. I remember interviewing Merle Evers Williams, and she talked about how in her second marriage, that one of the things she learned after Medgar Evers assassination is that she had to practice some self-care. Mm 
that the civil rights movement had so much sacrifice in it, and it does now too, like what we're talking about today. But one of the things we have learned is that we also have to give ourselves time for rest, for rejuvenation, and for coming together in community, however we connect, yeah. so that our love is not lost and it has expression and connection. Thank you for that, Jan. I just want to make it clear that when I when, when the COVID first hit and I I did go into a funk and I reached out and got some some help and so I want people to know that too is that's part of self care that Good. you can reach out and get therapy or talk to someone um, and what I learned from that was you got to keep going you know yeah. the world has changed but you got to keep going and I think that's part of the thing that fuels my desire to get on out there and and uh live yeah. because you know staying in the house was not not doing good for me i'm just so glad i finished all seven of my continents before covid hit i got the last one in antarctica in 2018 thank you god <laughs> i'm glad, I went, to finish that I'm glad I went to cabo in 2019 in hawaii it was yeah. like, and i've we'll also learned you too so. we'll do we'll do a travel show ladies at another time but <laughs> <laughs> i want well, now, danny king I, to I get some fun i, I want danny say, king to get some final thoughts yeah, before Dana? we wrap okay you okay. gotta wrap you up pretty soon me, huh you can't see me now i don't yeah, know what oh you can yeah okay um final thoughts on this MLK day and, and the struggle that has come before and its endlessness, um, you know, our opponents are playing long ball and, and they're not playing fair. The rules don't apply to them. And that's, that's a hard battle to fight, right? Because it, it's about our integrity. It's about our history. It's about our ancestors. And we also have to fight the long battle. And, and that requires us to be all in and, um, and to encourage what needs to be done and to, and to model what needs to be done. On election day, we gotta go pick up our seniors. I got a truck, it's not very clean, but I can pick up people. I mean, I can, I can participate in ways that go beyond my voting, right? Um, complacency is not an option. Our comfort will be our discomfort down the road. Mm -hmm. and, and we have to continue to lift up the spirit of our people. Um, and, and, when, and when you feel down, know that this is not the worst we've been through. We got through it all yeah. and we will get through it together, but we've got to keep it moving. And, and remember not to give up because we're angry because President Biden or Kamala Harris or somebody else didn't do exactly what you wanted. Don't let that cause you to say, I'm not going to support them anymore because that's how we got to some of this mm -hmm. because people got angry in 2016 because Bernie Sanders didn't win or because somebody else didn't win the nomination and they did not vote. There were whole group, groups of people in Michigan right. and in other states, we've seen the statistics, who did not vote. And don't ever let anybody take your vote from you. When you can, if you can crawl to the polls, go. Because uh, don't let anger keep you from saving us from what could be worse than what you're angry about. Thank and you. right now, it's so important to strategize. If, if you can't get water in line, then have way stations two miles down the road where people stack up with water and snacks and portable chairs so that if the lines are going to be there, there's that. But, but beyond that, strategies, just like the Montgomery bus boycott in those 13 months, people came together. So now is the time to do those strategies, to work together despite the pandemic, use the internet, connect, donate to different causes, look at what has worked, what helped turn Georgia blue, at least temporarily, mm -hmm. and hopefully continue with that. But those strategies are important and we can't wait even till June primaries. We have to oh, act right. today. Because the other side has been strategizing and changing the game plan in so yeah. many states. So many states. Have they are getting the opportunity to throw out votes. 
Yeah. Okay. Making okay. it legal to do it. <laughs> Rennell. <laughs> Rennell was like, okay. I'm getting a rap, ladies. I'm, I'm getting the rap. I appreciate this. I, I honestly wish there's so much to talk about. It's yes. so good to see all of you. Cheryl Heard, thank you for mentioning that you work on every King holiday, as did I when I was on the radio. It's so important. It's Same super here. important. And I, t- I tweeted this morning that when Jesse Jackson was on my radio show years ago, he always said that today is a day on not a day off. Right. So Mm -hmm. it's a day of service. It's a day of volunteerism today. Again, everything we've been talking about, call your senators, get busy on voting rights, um, self-care. Thank you all for sharing about that as well. It's so, so important. And I'll, I'll leave you with a quote that one of my girlfriends at the gym back in the day said, you don't have to burn yourself out to keep others warm. Okay. Oh, very good. I like Lady, that. hold on to that. Cheryl and Kamasi, like Jan, that. you're out there on the front lines doing the important work. We watch, we support, we love you. And to my sisters that are retired, we stand on your shoulders as well as those of Miss Belva Davis. So thank you for taking a lot of hits for us. You know, we still take them, but yeah. they have lessened. Thanks to what y'all went through. So we have I'll, stories. Yeah. <laughs> thank, and thank you, thank Renel, you for this and, and for Lena too for yes, bringing us yes. all together. It was yeah, wonderful. shout out to Lena Sullivan, our producer. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, and thank you, thank you all for thank being you MLK excellent. Committee. Thank you all for being excellent because otherwise none of us would be here. That's mm. right. Keep that in mind. If we black excellence, excellence. black <laughs> excellence is all over this production today. <laughs> and the love. love and the love i could feel the love today too that's yes. wonderful yes. yeah all Let's of that keep marching on yes. keep the dream alive keep Absolutely. hope alive <laughs> and as we thank everyone because we have allies and we have people of every race who care right. about dr king's dream and care about what's being done and want to see truth and want our voting rights protected so we thank you all and yes, we, we do your support thank y'all so much thanks everybody thanks to my girls thanks everybody for watching Go well, stay well, and keep on fighting because that's what we do as a people, right? Yes. Amen. Amen Until victory yeah. is won, march on. All right. <laughs> hey. Love y'all. Lots of love. Bye. 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 <laughs>
While Republicans in Congress continue to aid and abet this shameful campaign, Democrats are ferociously fighting back. I'm very happy to report that in the House this past week, we passed and sent to the Senate the Freedom to Vote John Lewis Act, vital legislation to protect the vote and strengthen our democracy. This includes our John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, which will empower the Department of Justice to block voting restrictions imposed by states with disgraceful history of discrimination. And it includes the Freedom to Vote Act, which will defend and expand voting rights, stop the nullification of elections, fight big money in politics, and extreme partisan gerrymandering and more. President Biden forcefully declared in Atlanta that the Senate must find a path forward to enshrine critical voting rights legislation into law as soon as possible. As you mobilize support for this legislation in Northern California, join many fighters for freedom across the nation, calling for immediate action. So as we mark Martin Luther King Day, and as we strive forward in our righteous fight for voting rights, let us draw strength and inspiration in this fight from Dr. King's immortal words. True peace is not merely the absence of tension, it is the presence of justice. Indeed, let us never relent in this pursuit of justice because nothing less than our democracy is at stake. Thank you all for your leadership in the fight for voting rights. Greetings, I am Congresswoman Barbara Lee and I proudly represent California's beautiful 13th Congressional District. I would like to thank the Northern California Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Community Foundation and the Alameda Labor Council, AFL-CIO, for inviting me to take part in the Voting Rights Day of Action. On this day of action, we pay homage to the principles Dr. King fought and died for. In 1965, President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act into law calling the day a triumph for freedom as huge as any victory that has ever been won on any battlefield. Activism, organizing, marching, and the pressure from Dr. King and the Southern Christian Leadership Council helped pave the way for this American milestone. Dr. King called the law a great step forward. However, Dr. King was aware that voting could only be effective if potential voters did not have the obstacles and fear associated with casting a vote. Yet, in 2022, many of us, especially people of color, are still facing disenfranchisement at the polls. We can no longer wait, especially as January 6th insurrection showed that white supremacy never left our halls of democracy. Many people still face the same fears as they head to the polls. So I thank each and every one of you for getting into some good trouble, as my friend and colleague, our beloved John Lewis, encouraged all of us to do. We cannot be full participants of this democracy without the right to vote. We cannot let go of this fight. We must keep going. I'm proud to be with you virtually today in the spirit of Dr. King and his quest for equality. And I look forward to working with all of you this year, as Dr. King said, to save the soul of America. Be safe. Thank you again.